this week on Oklahoma Horizon. Well, we examine the issue of hunger in the developing world. Austin Moore takes us to Uganda, Africa, to see how a group of Oklahomans are working to help the hungry feed themselves half a world away. Today on Horizon, we're talking about food security and the importance of a safe, reliable food supply. But our American system is the envy of the world. So to dig deeper into these issues, join me in Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Millions of people die every year for a ridiculous reason. They're just too poor to stay alive. Estimates are as many as 17,000 children die each and every day from hunger and malnutrition related illnesses. Today, we're going to look at the issue of food insecurity in the developing world through the eyes of a group of Oklahomans who thanks to a State Department grant have been working in Uganda, Africa. And this is where SUNUP correspondent Austin Moore starts us off. Well, this morning, the vast majority of us woke up with a wide variety of breakfast options. We know day to day where our food's gonna come from and with a reasonable amount of certainty that our food is safe and it won't make us ill. That's not the case in much of the world. Food security is a growing issue around the globe. We grow fortunes of nutritious food here in Oklahoma, but not everyone is so lucky. In too much of the world, agricultural producers are limited to subsistence farming or something just beyond that. Environmental factors, infrastructure failings, and cultural practices can all play a part. And with the world population expected to grow 30% by 2050, the agricultural sector will be under ever-increasing pressure. And so this week we visit Uganda, where the land is rich and the rains are plentiful, and yet so many struggle to get by. But before we get to that, let me explain why we are here. Well, the overarching purpose of the grant was to assist the African participants in improving food security in their countries. Well, I think the bottom line is having food in the right place at the right time for people when they need it. The concept is straightforward. Find individuals from Kenya and Uganda who can affect change. Bring them to Oklahoma, where they can intern with peers from their field, then follow up with them in Africa to see how they've been able to make a difference. Our focus was on media professionals, community leaders, and policymakers. Those were the three groups that we focused on in this project. And we really focused on the idea of developing a communication network between those three key groups uh, to hopefully help inform food security issues. Opening up those lines of dialogue are, are what we were really after, trying to allow person A who's over here to know person B and person C so that there's an open chain of communication that will hopefully allow for a better dialogue and ultimately a better approach to food security. A first group of fellows arrived in spring 2011. A team from Oklahoma State visited them that summer, recruiting a second group of African fellows. Those came in the fall. While here, they worked with their counterparts in government, in media, and in community development. When we return, I'll sit down with Austin to look at some of the work underway in Uganda to try to solve some age-old problems. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, it's been said that without food, people have only three options. They can riot, they can immigrate, or they can die. Harsh realities in the developing world where literally billions of dollars have been spent to try to relieve the suffering. Yet underlying factors remain which perpetuate 
a cycle of poverty and hunger that cause poor health and then in turn low productivity. It is a world very different than ours in this land of plenty, but one, a group of Oklahomans are hoping to change. Once on the ground, the problems facing Uganda presented themselves quickly. We started our journey in Uganda's largest city, Kampala. Words like congestion and traffic simply do not do justice to this beast known locally as the jam. You see, the latest estimates put the population of this town at about 1.7 million people. That's around a half a million more than Oklahoma City. But the square mileage of this city is closer to the size of Enid. The country is slightly bigger than Oklahoma, but with more than 10 times the population and an annual population growth rate of 3.2%. But it gets more complicated than that. You see, while the population is growing at 3.2%, agriculture is growing at only 26 And in a country situated on the equator, with two complete growing seasons and bimodal rains, 38% of children are considered malnourished or stunted. Now, in terms of agriculture, there are a small number of large corporate farms in Uganda. Tea, corn, and sugar are all grown in abundance here. But the vast majority of farms are small, an acre or less on average, and shrinking, because farms tend to be broken up among the children, and on average, every woman here will have seven children. Production agriculture is what we would consider in the United States as, as gardening. You know, obviously, whenever people have a garden on a half acre, they, they don't have John Deere tractors and Massey Ferguson's, and, and they do all of their planting and, and most of their harvesting by hand. And when you go around the, the country and look and look at, at agriculture, it's lots and lots and lots of produce and gardening um, programs going on and very little large-scale production agriculture. As we continue to pull back the layers and, and see more and more into these issues of food security, the, the lack of a food storage infrastructure, uh, problems in the transportation system, and, and the political infighting between ministries looking to see who has to address and who can address issues like malnutrition, you begin to see just what an immense task our fellows were up against. And yet there is some remarkable work being done. We started by growing tomatoes. Now, our first taste of that work came on the north side of Kampala, visiting a newly formed cooperative of tomato farmers. However much these farmers are near the town, the main city, they're very poor. At the moment, the tomatoes are not grown at a wide scale. But we're trying to improve on that. And with, we have the saving schemes. We are going to, with the money we've saved, we're going to enlarge our gardens. Cooperatives like this one were once the norm in Uganda. But several decades ago, they were abolished in the changing political winds. <laughs> yeah, cooperatives, it is unfortunate that uh, they, were, they were abolished, but uh, they are slowly coming back because of their advantages. We are encouraging them to start uh, consolidating or doing collective marketing whereby they bring whatever the little they have produced, collect it together at one collection center and then they market it out. Tomatoes are a cash crop and fetch an attractive price at market. So this group has joined together as a cooperative, pulling resources and savings in order to send the community's children to school. This is the kind of work our fellows tend to be involved in, teaching new techniques, disease controls, and marketing strategies. And joining me now in studio is the Emmy-nominated journalist who brings us these reports, Austin Moore. So I've got to ask, how was that cassava route I saw you munching on? Cassava was wonderful. That, that was a wonderful group of people. They really shared uh, a lot of their different fruits and vegetables they grow with us very generously that day. You know, something I was struck watching your report is, first of all, you know, the cooperatives that you're working on are exactly what that country needs. But when you take a look down the road, there's a couple of things. One, that their population in the developing world is expected to increase, according to UN numbers, by 2 billion people by 2050, just in 40 years. And then you also figure in that the UN projects that food prices are going to rise by 50% by that time. 
that's kind of a collision course, is it not? No, it, it is, and it, there are great challenges here. The longer we were in the country, though, the more we started to peel back the layers and see just how complicated the problems are. Yes, population growth is one of the most daunting things they're facing. Uh, yes, the, the lack of money in the country and the lack of distribution of the money in the, in the country is a big issue. But you get into infrastructure, you get into agricultural policy, you get into practices that are centuries old. The, the problems really stack on top of each other, and there's no simple, simple cure for these things. Yeah, certainly complex issues and one that I think probably the answers lie with the next generation, do they not? They do, and, and I think one thing to point out, there are a lot of folks in other countries, uh, China is doing a lot of investment there, we're doing a lot of investment. Really though, as you talk to the people, it needs to come from them. There's a strong feeling that they need to guide their own future, and, and I can't disagree with them on that. Well, that is what your next report is about as Austin takes us to some of the schools in Uganda. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, a tribe of pygmies makes the best of a bad situation. But first, food, education, and culture. Well, with 62% of Africa's population younger than 25, it is a continent with tremendous potential and it's with the youth of Uganda. Some of the fellows Austin has introduced us to are doing some of their absolute best work. One place where both population issues and agricultural challenges are converging is in the schools, like this one we visited outside Kampala. It is here that you can see both how devastating population growth has been on this country and yet how much potential there is in that population. That is 1,000 students for a handful of classrooms. So this is our class for primary five. These kids are sharp and motivated to have a better life, but they are sitting 160 deep in a single classroom. Thank you. When they do this, add that to a history in Uganda of agriculture being used as punishment in school. Get caught talking in class? Go dig a furrow, act out during a lesson, spend the afternoon weeding the garden. As a professional educator, in the context of agriculture, uh, I really take great exception or umbrage to that. And I've been very plain with the fellows about that. And I think most of them realize that fundamentally that is a mistake. That if, that if the young people identify agriculture solely with punishment and drudgery, it's going to be very difficult to attract them to agricultural careers. But there is an effort to change that culture. At this school, agriculture is now taught as a science, and the school garden, managed within the curriculum, helps supplement the meals. But with so many children, the garden simply cannot produce enough. The idea behind is to give an opportunity to these kids to understand the agronomic practices as per the different crops. But how do you get messages out to those actively involved in agriculture? Television and internet are available to few outside the cities. Radio is where 80% of Ugandans get their news. But the format and the journalists there are ill-equipped for the detailed messages ag producers need. Fortunately, this country that lacks so much in terms of infrastructure got one part of it wonderfully right. Uh, you know, what you'll find in the developing world, in Kenya and Uganda in particular, that, that I've experienced, um, and, and in Mali to some degree, uh, they've, they've skipped the landline, the telephone line. They've skipped it, you know. It, and even people that live in traditional African huts, their family has a cell phone, and um, there's coverage. I, I haven't ever found a place in Uganda so far that my cell phone doesn't work. And those cell phones are how one fellow, Daniel Nensima, is trying to bridge the gap between producers and sellers and to shift the power structure of Ugandan agriculture away from the traders in the middle. On our final day, Daniel took KOSU's Rachel Hubbard, photojournalist Mitch Akala, and myself to an urban market 
and introduced us to a man who buys and sells potatoes. So he says they use brokers. There are brokers who go to the villages to look for the potatoes. So they load them onto the trucks and bring them to Kampala. So he buys from the brokers. The price that the brokers actually give them uh, is quite higher compared to the price that they buy at from the farmers. And that is where the cell phone technology comes in. Daniel offers negotiating power to both ends of the chain. First of all, we started using SMS short text messaging, where we collect information from the different markets in Kampala and then share that with our farmers in the field. Then also get the prices of the different products in the market and share that with our traders in Kampala. Because uh, the project was about bringing the traders in Kampala, the potato traders in Kampala, with the potato farmers in, in Kabala and Kisoro to come to an agreement and be able to uh, like establish uh, a formal price, come into agreement and sell the product like on a contract sort of basis. So every morning I call him or he calls me to update me the information on the different prices of the different products on the, in this market. So then I upload that, I, then I share that with the different farmers and the different traders that we have in our database. Daniel hopes this market information can help widen profit margins for farmers like Nabawanga Gustine. Okay. So she says the cost of transporting a product from BG up to this market is high because the drivers keep telling them that uh, uh, gas is expensive. So that makes transport very expensive for them. And the other thing is that the tax, because they tax them to have a stall in this market. So before they enter this market, they have to pay a certain fee. And that says, she says that is very high. So it makes her products very expensive. And it makes, you know, it kind of reduces her sales and her profit margins. The market is hard to describe. I'm not even sure I'm able to convey just how busy and tightly packed the area truly is. As fresh and appetizing as so much of this harvest is, inches away, the path you walk on is the rotting leftovers from the markets of the past days and weeks. So Austin, certainly in a country where there's no refrigeration, uh, their fresh markets are a little bit different than what we're used to, yes. to say the least. Yes. But you know what I was really struck by in that story is the conversations that you were having there. They're the exact same conversation I know you and I both have had out in a farmer's field right here in Oklahoma. That was one of the things that surprised me the most during our visit. Every time we met with a farmer, every time we met with someone who worked with ag, they really did feel like I was talking with their counterparts here. Uh, the same issues, the same savvy about what they needed to do exists. Uh, but as you touched on, one of the big issues is storage and refrigeration. You know, milk that's not sold is poured out. Fruits and vegetables that weren't sold in that market are thrown down. And that's what we were walk walking on was the day before's wares that weren't sold. So truly they are subject to supply and demand. If the demand is right now and they have the supply, but there's very little storage? Well, yes, there is very little storage. There's very little trust in the electricity system. It really went out on us four or five times a day, wherever we're at. This is one of the big issues with food security in the country. In the southwest part of the country, there is a ton of food. There's a ton of production. In the northeast part of the country, it's very dry and arid and they need the food. But getting it there, getting the storage, being able to keep it, and doing something with it beyond you know, uh, the, the improved products, it, it just doesn't happen. Certainly something very different than what we're used to here. Now I know you also got to meet a tribe of pygmies that have been evicted from their homeland and now they're trying to figure out how to survive in this new world that they've been presented with. If you would, set the stage for us. And certainly. About halfway through the trip, we drove down to the southwest corner of the country. I uh, ended up about 10 miles from Rwanda at this point. To, before we got to the pygmies, we drove to a place for lunch. Now, before we get to that place, there's tribes of folks, families sitting on the sides of a mountain with little hammers, grandparents, baby children, hitting rocks with hammers to make gravel to sell to construction companies. Just beyond that, we get to this resort owned by a wonderful Belgian gentleman. And this is a nicer resort, as you can imagine. This is the place where if you're really rich, you're going to go take your honeymoon. Amazing place. So then we drive up the mountain in the rain uh, through a, quite an adventure, end up actually meeting this small tribe of pygmies who were some of the most animated people we met on our trip. In the southwestern tip of the country, only miles from Rwanda, we were introduced to the Botwa pygmies. Historically, this was a tribe of the forest who collected honey for trade. But in 1991, they were evicted 
as their forest became a national park for guerrilla conservation. The transition into civilization has not been easy, and fellow Daniel Nansima has been working to improve their opportunities. Well, uh, the pygmies actually are traditionally uh, honey gatherers. They were, uh, I mean, the tradition from the forest. So when they were banished from the forest, they had to like uh, devise means of like living, and they had started making the traditional beehives. But then their traditional beehives have, have a problem that when it rains, they kind of get wet and the bees cannot colonize them. So trying to introduce like modern beehives that have uh, a roof on them to stop the rain from like getting inside, so they can at least get more honey and get more money out of it. Mm. In addition to improving their own honey gathering operation, the pygmies hope to manufacture these modern beehives for sale outside the community. Daniel has also introduced the concept of savings to this community, which traditionally has spent money as soon as it's been earned. In just a short time, they've already saved 45,000 shillings. Now that's only about $20 here in the States, but to this group, that's a massive achievement. As our time in Uganda came to a close, there were a few things this group of Okies all came to agree on. First, none of us will miss Kampala and its traffic. Even with the amazing crew of drivers we had, it just isn't worth the stress. Second, we genuinely like the Ugandan people, especially the farmers. There is something universal about the practice of agriculture, the determination in the eyes of man battling to tame nature. It's the same, whether you're in Fairview or Mambara. Finally, the challenges that lay before this country are great. The problems are complex, layered, and deeply rooted. If you were to ask the 10 of us where to begin, which issue should be the priority, you'd likely get 10 different answers. But I think we'd all agree that the future of Uganda may begin with the fellows. These individuals are innovative and determined. I strongly suspect that someday they'll look back at all they've achieved for their country and reflect on the role played by their time in Oklahoma. So, Austin, what happens from here? All right, well, in terms of the grant that we traveled on, that's done, that's expired. However, this group at Oklahoma State, uh, they certainly, they've been to Africa before, they're gonna continue seeking opportunities to help educate. And I think really that's what this country and the others in the region need, is just the opportunity to interact with those who've, who've been down a different path and to help introduce better science, uh, better practices to their cultures. Well, well certainly a, a nice piece of work, one that you can be proud of, and one we'd like to link to on our website. I know you've got it all online. Absolutely. All right, thank you so much, Austin. Good job. If you're interested in Oklahoma culture, you can keep up with us throughout the week on the Red Dirt Chronicles blog. Look for our On the Horizon postings on Tuesdays and Fridays and tell us what you think. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we revisit an ongoing problem in our schools, school bullying. When people used to make fun of me, I used to go home and either try and just keep it bottled up or I, uh, I used to cut myself. Keeping our schools safe on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, anyone that has ever worked in the developing world will tell you it's easy to get discouraged. Case in point, Mali, Africa. I was able to go there in 2007 to work with local journalists. Located in Western Africa, the country of Mali is in many ways a study of success. 
Culturally diverse, Mali has risen above ancient tribal tensions that still plague much of the continent. Yet in the developing world, there's a razor's edge between success and disaster. When Muammar Gaddafi was killed and Libya fell into disarray, his weapons became available. The Tuareg people who live in the northern part of Mali that borders Libya seize those weapons and declare their own independence. Now frustrated with their government's inability to do anything about that rebellion, the Mali military staged a bloodless coup in the south. Then Islamic radicals who have always sought a bigger presence in that part of Africa came in and fought the Tuareg overpowering them, and now the northern part of Mali is controlled by Islamic militias linked to Al-Qaeda. And more than a half a million people have had to flee for their lives. That in a country that had been one of Africa's most successful democracies. And as we've seen time after time, political instability leads to the very food and security issues we've been talking about all day today. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching.